a series or infinite series is a sum of infinitely many numbers. Series and infinite series are the same things, just sometimes we include the word infinite to emphasize how cool these are. And cool is indeed the right word. We are about to begin studying some seriously cool stuff. Sure, it's cool, you might say, but does it even make sense? Can we take a sum of infinitely many numbers? Of course we can. Check this out. Consider 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 forever. 0 is a number, and here we've got infinitely many zeros being added to 1, so I'd say this is equal to 1. So heck yeah, we can sum infinitely many numbers. But of course, there's not much work for us to do when the sum is just a bunch of zeros. What we're really interested in are sums of infinitely many non-zero numbers. Like, for example, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on. This is a sum of infinitely many non-zero numbers. So does it diverge to infinity? Is it equal to negative 1 12th? What can we say about such a sum? Well, that's what this is all about. Once we've introduced infinite series, we'll be able to analyze all sorts of sums of infinitely many numbers. And these are the sorts of problems that have perplexed people since ancient times. In this lesson, we'll take a look at one of Zeno's paradoxes, which we need infinite series to make sense of. Then we'll see some important definitions and terminology relating to series, and finally end with a few examples for you to start thinking about. We begin with Zeno of Elia, who lived from around 495 BC to 430 BC. Zeno was one of those many very smart Greek philosophers, and he argued that motion is an illusion. This may seem like a silly thing to say, since we see things move all of the time. But Zeno argued his case by presenting several paradoxes, which made ordinary motion seem impossible. His various paradoxes are pretty similar, so we'll just take a quick look at one of them, and I'll leave a link in the description to a video where we look at some more. This paradox involves an archer shooting at a target. Suppose he's shooting his arrow at a target that is, let's say, one unit of distance away. Doesn't matter what the unit is. Plenty of us have shot arrows at targets, or at least seen arrows being shot at and hitting targets. So, of course, this arrow, like any other arrow, could travel this distance and hit the target. But Zeno argued, in order for the arrow to travel that distance and hit the target, certainly it first has to travel half of that distance. That seems fair enough. That leaves half of the distance left to go. But before the arrow travels that half distance, it has to travel half of that, which would be a fourth of the total. Then there would only be a fourth remaining. But again, before traveling that fourth, the arrow will have to first travel half of that distance, which would be an eighth. And you can see how this continues infinitely. An eighth of the distance remains, but in order to travel that eighth, the arrow would first have to travel half of that, which is a sixteenth. So, in order for the arrow to travel one unit and hit its target, it needs to travel half of the distance, plus a fourth of the distance, plus an eighth of the distance, and so on. And there's the paradox. In order to travel a single unit of distance, the arrow needs to travel infinitely many steps. And seemingly, it must travel an infinite distance, since this is a sum of infinitely many positive numbers, in order to travel a single unit. And thus, it would seem that the arrow can't travel anywhere. How can we make sense of this? Well, for starters, we could write this in some more compact notation using sigma notation. That's what the sum would look like in sigma notation. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson introducing this notation. It's very important that you're comfortable with it because we'll be using it a lot. The crux of this problem, of course, is the idea of adding infinitely many positive numbers. 
It's not at all obvious that adding infinitely many positive numbers could produce a finite number. Since adding a positive number just makes the sum bigger and we're adding infinitely many, it seems like this could diverge to infinity. And it's not like we can just add up the infinitely many terms to see if that's true or not. So what could we do to try to analyze this series? Well, I can't add up infinitely many numbers, but I can add up one number. I could also add up two numbers. I could probably add up three numbers, or I might even be able to handle four. If we were to add up just the first number, that would of course be one half. If we were to add up the first two numbers, that would be a half plus a fourth, which happens to equal three fourths. Adding up the first three numbers gives us a half plus a fourth, plus an eighth, which is equal to seven eighths, and so on. We could continue calculating these partial sums as long as we wanted. And by calculating these partial sums, we've created a sequence. We've got the sum of the first number, then the sum of the first two numbers, then the sum of the first three numbers, and so on if we continued. Does it look like these sums are diverging to infinity? I wouldn't say so. To me, it looks like they're getting closer and closer to one. And in fact, it is through the sequence of partial sums that we analyze a series. So since this sequence of partial sums converges to one, we say that the limit of the series is one. And we can write simply that the series equals one. So Zeno was right and wrong. He was right that in order to travel one unit of distance, the arrow needs to travel one half plus a fourth plus an eighth plus a sixteenth and so on. But he was wrong about that being an infinite untravelable distance. It turns out that even though it is a sum of infinitely many positive numbers, that sum is equal to one. And this is the big idea of our analysis of infinite series. We'll look at all sorts of different series and figure out which ones have a finite sum and which ones don't. But of course, writing a sum of infinitely many numbers equals one is pretty different from how we've used equals in the past. So it's important to be precise about what we mean when we write that a series equals something. So now let's look at some terms and definitions. Here is a representation of an arbitrary infinite series. And I should note before we dig into all this that much of the wording we're about to see is taken exactly from a textbook called Real Analysis by Jay Cummings. It is a fantastic textbook. I'll leave a link in the description to buy it on Amazon. I highly recommend it. When we have an infinite series Series like this, the numbers a, k that we're adding up are called the terms of the series. Note that these numbers are also terms of their own sequence. The series is adding up these terms a1, a2, a3, and so on. In this way, a series is like a sum of a sequence, which is super cool. So from a series, we could consider the sequence of its terms, the numbers that are being added in the series, but we could also go the other direction. You could say, hey, I've got this really cool sequence BN. And I could say, forget about your dumb sequence BN, I want to talk about the series adding the terms of that sequence. And this is what that would look like. So once more, the numbers being added together in a series are called the terms of the series. Those terms, of course, make up their own sequence. So this is a nice connection between series and sequences, but there is a more important connection waiting for us. That is the idea we touched on earlier regarding the sequence of partial sums, which we might call Sn. Before we get bogged down by notation, just remember that the nth partial sum is the sum of the first n terms of the series. This expression inside the parentheses represents the nth partial sum. 
It says sum up the terms a k from k equals 1, the first term, to k equals n, the nth term. And then we're taking the sequence of all of those partial sums. And again, this is super important because it is with the sequence of partial sums that we will analyze a series. And that's convenient because we've spent a bunch of time studying sequences and proving results about them. So let's see some examples of the terms from the sequence of partial sums. Here is S1, the first partial sum. It goes from k equals one to k equals one. So it's just the first term of of the series A1. This is the second partial sum, S2. It goes from k equals one to k equals two. So it's the sum of the first two terms of the series, A1 plus A2. This is the third partial sum, S3. It goes from k equals one to k equals three. It's the sum of the first three terms of the series, A1 plus a2 plus a3. Here is the fourth partial sum, and in general, the nth partial sum, Sn. Again, the nth partial sum is the sum of the first n terms of the series. The sequence of these partial sums is how we make conclusions about the series. And now here's the good stuff. We say that a series converges to a real number and write that the series equals that number if the sequence of partial sums converges to that number. And remember, that means the partial sums get arbitrarily close to that number. And I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson going over the definition of the limit of a sequence if you need a recap about what exactly that means. And we characterize divergent series the same way. We say that the series diverges if the sequence of partial sums does. This includes the particular type of divergence. So if the sequence of partial sums diverges to infinity or to negative infinity, then the series does as well. Or if the limit of the sequence of partial sums does not exist, then the limit of the series does not exist. And remember that comes up when we have an oscillating sequence like the sequence negative one to the power of n. It goes from negative one to one to negative one to one and so on. If we were to consider the series adding up the terms of this sequence and then look at the partial sums, those would be negative one, then zero, then negative one, then zero, and so on. This sequence of partial sums certainly doesn't converge, and it doesn't diverge to infinity or negative infinity. Its limit simply does not exist. And so we would say that the limit of the series adding up the terms of this sequence also does not exist. But remember that it's possible for the terms of a sequence to alternate between positive and negative and still have the sequence converge. And a similar thing is true about series and their partial sums. We will, of course, see plenty of interesting examples as we continue our study. Finally, we also say that a series is bounded or is monotone if the sequence of partial sums is. I'll leave a link in the description to my lesson proving the monotone convergence theorem. You might remember by that theorem, certainly boundedness and monotoneness are very important properties. And that's it, there's nothing too complicated here. I think the biggest difficulty is getting comfortable with seeing all of the sigma notation when we're talking about series. But you always want to be thinking about that sequence of partial sums because that's usually what we're really analyzing. When we say that an infinite series converges to a real number and we write that the series equals that number, that's because the sequence of partial sums converges to that number. So all of our results about sequences are going to be tremendously useful as we continue studying series. Finally, here are a few examples of infinite series which we will analyze in the future. In a geometric series, there is a common ratio between consecutive terms. That ratio is r. The terms are a, ar, ar squared, ar cubed, and so on. So think about what will happen in a geometric series if that common ratio r is, say, between 0 and 1. 
Or what if it's between negative one and zero? What if it's equal to one? What if it's equal to negative one? What if its absolute value is greater than one? I encourage you to think of some examples and see what happens. Pick an R value, pick an A value, and calculate some partial sums. The first series we looked at in Zeno's paradox was an example of a geometric series. In that series, we had A equals one half and R equals one half. Our first term was one half, and each subsequent term was one half times the previous one. Another example of a geometric series you're probably familiar with is 0 0.999 repeating. This is what that looks like with sigma notation. It's nine tenths plus nine hundredths plus nine thousandths and so on. Each term of the series is equal to the previous one times one tenth. One tenth is the common ratio. So A here is equal to nine tenths and R the common ratio is one tenth. And you've probably seen a proof or several proofs that 0.9 repeating and thus this series are equal to one. If perhaps your algebra teacher or someone else just started off by saying, hey, let's let x equal 0.99 repeating. What they snuck by you was the fact that they have assumed that this is actually equal to some finite number. But of course, not every series is equal to a finite number. That's something we have to prove. The series adding up the non-negative integers, for example, this one certainly diverges to infinity. And remember, writing this equals infinity is not a lazy abuse of notation. We've specified what we mean by this. We mean that the sequence of partial sums, which we might call Sn, diverges to infinity. Another very famous example of an infinite series is the harmonic series. This is the sum of the reciprocals of the natural numbers. One plus a half, plus a third, plus a fourth, and so on. And now is as good a time as any to point out that our starting index value isn't super important. Here, k starts at one, but if we wanted it to start at zero, then we could do that and just, instead of having k in the denominator, have k plus one. That would be the same series, but with a different starting index. So that doesn't really matter, but it's generally good form to start with a value of one or zero if possible. So how do you think this series behaves? Try punching in some of the partial sums on a calculator and see what you think. The harmonic series is actually a special type of a more general class of series called P-series. With a P-series, this P is fixed. And then the series consists of the sum of the reciprocals of the pth powers of the natural numbers. One over one to the p, which is one, plus one over two to the p, plus one over three to the p, plus one over four to the p, and so on. The harmonic series is a p series with p equal to one, which gives you that one plus a half, plus a third, plus a fourth, and so on. So P equals one is the harmonic series, which is interesting, but another interesting P series is P equals two. The P series with P equals two is one over one squared, which is one, plus one over two squared, which is one fourth, plus one over three squared, so one ninth, and so on. Believe it or not, somehow this series is equal to pi squared over six. The great Leonard Euler proved this when he was just 24. So if that doesn't get you excited to continue studying infinite series, I don't know what will. This is really exciting stuff we're doing. Again, a series is a sum of infinitely many numbers. And we say that a series converges to a real number and write the series equals the number if the sequence of partial sums converges to that number. So that's it for now. Pay your respects to our boy Zeno. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll see you next time. Goodness gracious, she's a crazy kitten. Goodness gracious, she's a crazy kitten. She's a crazy, crazy kitten.